Turtles of Missouri Streams. Uh, I don't want to do this just because you heard I have an interest in reptiles, like many people, but uh, it's also hard to frequent uh, any Missouri River or any water body and, and not come across turtles. They're, uh, they're a pretty common sight. Uh, but a lot of people really don't know that much about them as far as the public goes. Uh, so I kind of wanted to do this presentation for that reason. Uh, so uh, as far as turtles go, uh, there's about 356 species worldwide. Uh, they're the third most diverse group of reptiles. Uh, in Missouri, we have about 17 species, and this is terrestrial and semi-aquatic turtles. Uh, about 12 of those 17 are, are kind of widespread and common. Uh, the other ones have more limited distributions in the state. Uh, and all but two species of, of the turtles in Missouri are semi-aquatic. Uh, the only exceptions would be the two box turtle species, like the uh, one in this picture. Uh, aside from them, uh, all our other turtle species are living in or near water. So some basic anatomy. Uh, turtles are pretty unique because of their shell. So their shell is made kind of from a combination of the rib cage. So their ribs have been kind of widened out uh, as well as also kind of dermal armor, osteoderms, so little pieces of bone under the skin covered in scale. Other reptiles have this too, like crocodilians, but in turtles, they kind of took that and ran with it. So each one of those little pieces of armor kind of fused together to form these really large plates, uh, and that fused with their skeleton to form almost kind of an exoskeleton. Uh, no other vertebrate has anything like this. Uh, I mean, even their, uh, their shoulder girdle is now within their rib cage, and that's unique to turtles. Uh, Anyone who's looked at a turtle shell also knows that their spine has been completely fused to the top of their shell as well. Uh, yeah, turtles can't take off their shells any more than uh, you can take off your rib cage. Uh, and the shell, of course, uh, it's made of bone, but the outer layer is covered in scales. As turtles are reptiles. Uh, and they do kind of shed those scales, or at least aquatic turtles do, every now and then. Uh, so each uh, scale actually sheds off as one big piece, as opposed to, say, a snake, which sheds its entire skin in one go. Uh, and the rest of the body is usually covered in small to large scales. Uh, the larger scales tend to be on the arms, outside of the arms. Uh, and the shell is composed of two different parts. So the top part is called the carapace, and the bottom part, as you can see in this picture, uh, it's called the plastron, and the plastron is mainly made from the uh, sternum, and those are just kind of fused together to form one complete shell. <laughs> and obviously, turtles lack teeth. Uh, they've kind of foregone teeth, as many ancient reptile groups have, uh, in place of a beak. It's just made of keratin, kind of like a bird beak. Uh, and it's kind of a pretty decent multi-tool. They, they use it for all kinds of different things as far as what they consume. Uh, so most of our turtles, they're pretty easily observed basking. Uh, many of them are in the family of turtles known as basking turtles. Uh, they're doing this uh, as a form of thermoregulation. So obviously they're reptiles, they're cold-blooded. Uh, they're only as warm as their environment. Uh, so they have to bask in the sun to warm up their body tissues to become metabolically active. Uh, so they can then go about their day and uh, grow and eat and reproduce. Uh, Aquatic turtles, they tend to bask quite a lot, and it's probably because water is kind of cold. It's often colder than the air, and it tends to suck warmth uh, much quicker than the air does. Uh, so when they're swimming around, uh, they're getting cold much more quickly, so they have to bask frequently throughout the day. Uh, that said, many of our turtles actually are very cold tolerant, as you can see in this picture. Uh, many of them will become somewhat active or bask on warm winter days. Uh, I know I've seen some in Valentine's Day in the 40s or 50s just out asking. It's like it was summer. Uh, sometimes so you can even see them kind of walking around under the ice, depending on the species. And uh, if you ever wonder what turtles, where they go in the winter when they're not walking around, uh, they actually spend most of it underwater, usually buried in sediment. 
and you might might ask how they breathe when they're doing that, and uh, they kind of don't. They also kind of do. Uh, so turtles can actually extract some oxygen from the water uh, via gaseous, gaseous exchange for their skin, as well as their cloaca, which is kind of their bodily orifice at the rear end, uh, as well as their throat. So they can actually absorb enough oxygen through those tissues, which are very thin, highly vascularized often, uh, to kind of get enough oxygen to survive in the winter. So might not have thought uh, air breathing vertebrate could do that, but uh, they can. Nature's pretty cool that way. Uh, there's some that can actually survive without any oxygen whatsoever. So some turtle species like uh, painted turtles and snapping turtles, uh, they can actually survive in totally anoxic water with zero oxygen. Uh, say like in a pond, which is often where they're found. And they can do that through uh, anaerobic respiration, uh, which is a chemical pathway to use the energy without oxygen. Now we can do this too, to a very limited extent, say in our muscles, when we're exercising, uh, our bodies just use up the glycogen stored in the muscles as a quick source of energy without any oxygen. Uh, it's not a very efficient way of making energy. It doesn't make a lot of it. Uh, but because you can do it without oxygen, uh, that's what these turtles use. Uh, and because, you know, it's winter and their temperatures are very, very cold, uh, the turtles' demand for oxygen is very, very low anyway. So they have a very low metabolism at this time. So they really don't need that much, much oxygen. Uh, so they can get by uh, with what little they're absorbing through their tissues because they're not as efficient as, say, amphibians or fish in that regard. But they get by. Uh, as far as diet goes, uh, they're generally omnivorous, or at least generalistic, but eat pretty much anything. Uh, they're kind of like bears or little pigs in that regard. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, specialization as far as diet goes in turtles and tortoises. Uh, some tend to lean a little stronger towards carnivory or herbivory, and that often changes as they get older. So young turtles will often eat a little more, a lot more animal matter just because they need the more protein for growing, uh, whereas adult turtles, they just need to maintain their tissues instead of growing them, so they often eat more plants. Uh, as far as what they're eating, it can be aquatic plants, it can be algae, invertebrates like insects or crayfish, snails, mussels. Sometimes they'll eat carrion. Uh, I've seen them eating hot dogs <laughs> thrown in the creek. Uh, they'll eat amphibians as well, frogs, tadpoles and reptiles like small snakes and other turtles sometimes. Uh, most turtles mate in the spring, although there is some mating depending on the species through summer and fall. As you can see, these two snapping turtles are mating. Uh, most turtles mate in the water. That makes things a little easier. Uh, and they tend to lay their eggs starting in May. That can last throughout the summer. Uh, Depending on the species, they may only lay two or three. A uh, large snapping turtle might lay 30 or more, like this female. Uh, they're usually laying their eggs in looser substrate, things like sand or loose soil. It's just easier to dig. I think it drains better than, say, clay, uh, so their eggs aren't being flooded as easily. There's another turtle laying its eggs. As far as the eggs go, they're pretty spherical, kind of like little golf balls usually, although some species are a little more elongate. Uh, and unlike bird eggs, uh, all living reptile eggs tend to be much more leathery. Uh, they have much more pliable shells. They're thinner, they're not as hard, not as uh, brittle either, <laughs> kind of flexible. Uh, they're just, it's not as heavily calcified as bird eggs because they don't really need to be. Uh, they're an important, important source of food for a lot of different animals. Uh, Skunks and raccoons will dig up turtle eggs. Uh, pigs will do the same. And even some snakes will uh, stake out turtle nests and rob the nests of eggs. Uh, they take quite a while to incubate. Usually hatch after two or three months, which is pretty typical for reptiles just because they're not being incubated by a mother. So uh, they're not being kind of fostered and maintained at a higher temperature, say, that uh, a bird egg would be, because it has a nice mother bird sitting on it, keeping it warm throughout the day. So it takes them a little longer to develop. And the hatchlings are generally about an inch or less long, maybe a little more, depending on the species. And again, the, the hatchlings are pretty easy prey. 
just like the eggs for a lot of different animals. Uh, but as they get older, obviously, they have very few predators, uh, at least the larger species, just because their shell is such good protection. And Sam, we did have a question in the chat um, kind of pertaining to the anatomy that you talked about um, in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, um, when does the turtle's spine fuse with the shell during turtle development? <laughs> hmm. As far as that goes, I imagine it would be pretty early on. Yeah. I did something about how their shoulder girdle, at some point in the development, it kind of pinches inward, and then their rib cage grows around that. Uh, as far as when they start to actually developing the shell elements in the embryo, uh, I don't know. Be an interesting question. Interesting answer. Yeah. All right. So now we're kind of going to shift gears and we're going to go over the uh, common stream dwelling turtle species of Missouri. So the first family we're going to go over is the most diverse. It's called the Metidae. Uh, they're often called terrapins or pond turtles or the basking turtles. Uh, we have 11 different species in Missouri, but we're only going to kind of go over uh, a few of those, the most common of them. As you can see, they're often called basking turtles. Uh, there's a couple different species here, but uh, they're all very prolific baskers, far more than some of our other turtle species. All right, so the first one we're going to go over is the painted turtle. This is actually two species now. Uh, there's the western painted turtle, which is the most widespread in Missouri. Uh, it's pretty much all over the state. And then the southern painted turtle, which occurs kind of in the keel in the southeast region the lowland swampy areas. Uh, it's a bit smaller, and uh, its most distinguishing feature from the western painted turtle is it has, well, a bright orange stripe going down the back. So uh, pretty easy to tell apart. Another way to tell them apart is the plastron, so the bottom of their shell. Uh, the western painted turtles by far have the most beautiful plastron of any Missouri turtle. It's just bright red and covered in all intricate green patterns. Uh, the southern painted turtle is just kind of boring, plain. Some cute little painted turtle hatchlings, utterly adorable. They're about an inch long or so when they're, when they're hatched. Uh, so these guys, they normally prefer slow moving or still waters. Uh, so in rivers, you usually only find them in kind of backwater areas or kind of slow moving side channels or oxbows, uh, places where the water usually isn't flowing much or at all. And it's accumulated a lot of mud or uh, otherwise fine sediment. It's growing in a lot of aquatic vegetation. So those are the kind of habitats that they like. Uh, they're not going to usually going to be in really fast moving or gravelly stream beds. Uh, you often find them in wetlands uh, just because they're full of aquatic vegetation, slow moving water. Uh, they're also a very common pond turtle. Uh, probably one of the three most common turtles to show up in any artificial pond. You can find them in city ponds or farm ponds. So this is just kind of typical habitat, lots of aquatic vegetation everywhere. As far as their diet goes, pretty omnivorous like most turtles. Uh, they'll eat a bit of anything, really, nothing too exciting. Uh, as I said, they're very common, uh, especially in ponds, and they will travel pretty far distances for a turtle over land uh, to reach different water bodies. Uh, and that's in case, say, if the pond or the marsh they're living in dries up for the summer, or if they're traveling over land somewhere to lay their eggs, or just to find a new body of water with new turtles to mate with. Uh, they, they will travel probably a couple miles or so between water bodies. So it's not uncommon to find them out of the water, even though they are a water turtle. Just a picture of a bunch of them on a culvert. It's pretty common for basking turtles to all bask together on really ideal basking spots. And you can find these guys in ditches all over the state. Uh, they're really not picky about habitat. And this is just again to show uh, the really colorful underside, the plastron of this western painted turtle anyway. Uh, one of the most distinguishing features. So uh, this family of turtles can be pretty hard to tell apart, especially at a distance. So the next one uh, is closely related. It's the red-eared slider. 
probably the most well-known popular turtle in America. Uh, they occur statewide. It's pretty common. You can find it in almost any water body. Uh, they get pretty big, about eight inches or so. Uh, obviously, they're called red-eared sliders because they have a very distinctive red stripe going down their face or their neck. Their shell is usually kind of brown, uh, lots of different yellow and brown stripes, different markings. You see, they can be pretty colorful, especially when they're in the water, and they have a clean shell. Uh, a lot of turtles, they tend to accumulate lots of mud and algae on their shell, which uh, can really obscure the markings and make identification pretty hard. So, yeah, you can see this one's kind of covered in algae. And then you can see the very distinctive red stripe on its face. So the, these guys, their underside is a little more colorful. So it's usually kind of bright yellow with lots of dark markings. And it changes a bit as they age. Uh, so as you can see, the larger turtle on the left is an adult. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but some of its patterns have become a little more obscure. Uh, for instance, its red ear, uh, it's not as clear. It's a little more muddled, it's faded as opposed to the smaller, younger one on the right. Uh, in some extreme cases, they can be almost almost totally black. And supposedly this is mostly in the older male red-eared sliders. Uh, they just accumulate lots of dark pigment that obscures all their pattern. Uh, so sometimes they might not have a red ear at all or, or any visible stripes. And it's not uncommon for reptiles. A lot of reptiles kind of grow either darker or duller in color as they age. The juveniles are really adorable. Uh, they're bright green. <laughs> Again, that fades with age. Uh, why they color change so dramatically, if I had to guess, I'd say one, uh, it might be camouflage. So bright green, long, young little turtles are kind of blending in more with the aquatic vegetation <clears throat> that they're going to be hiding in, uh, whereas opposed to larger turtles, you might not need that might also be just different color schemes, different sizes being more or less visible to different predators. Uh, but another reason for that might be is that uh, as those turtles are getting larger, having a darker coloration might make it easier for them to absorb more heat. Obviously, dark things get hotter quicker than lighter colored things. Uh, so because they're larger, it's taking them longer to heat up. So if they're darker in color, it kind of speeds that process along. Uh, if you think maybe about Trying to microwave, say, a French fry in the microwave versus a full potato. It's going to take that potato a lot longer to heat up than it is a uh, French fry. So uh, those turtles want to be darker to kind of speed up that process so they can warm up sufficiently and then go about their day. It's a cute little baby. These guys have similar habitat preferences to the painted turtles, although they're probably a little more generalistic. As I said, you can find them in most water bodies. Uh, you can find them in uh, city ponds and farm ponds. Uh, you can find them in backwaters. Uh, you can find them in Ozark streams as well, although they do tend to prefer the uh, slower moving waters, backwater areas uh, with lots of aquatic vegetation. I saw one on the Portoy River a few weeks ago, pretty big adult. Um, once it was disturbed, it ran right into a big patch of uh, pond lilies and buried itself in the mud. As far as their diet goes, they're omnivorous. Uh, the adults generally eat more plant matter than the uh, juveniles, as we talked about. But uh, they are pretty opportunistic, and they'll eat most things if given the chance. Uh, interesting thing about these guys, they have become a very popular pet turtle, uh, both in America and across the world. So during around the 1950s to the 70s or so, uh, they were in almost every pet shop. There were huge turtle farms breeding millions of turtles to be sold to people. Um, if anyone remembers Rocky, you know, Rocky goes into the pet shop, you know, buys the little turtles and the turtle food so we can talk to Adrian. Uh, those little baby turtles were little red eared sliders. So they're a very common pet, uh, and they were being exported across the world as well. And obviously, you know, they make little cute pets when they're this long. And you can keep them in a goldfish bowl like Rocky did. Uh, but if you know they don't die and you care for them well enough that they grow, they get pretty big and hard to take care of. So uh, like many other reptiles and other animals, they get uh, tossed out into the wild to fend for themselves because people don't want to take care of them anymore. Um, 
And they have actually become an invasive species uh, across the world on multiple continents. Uh, so they're an invasive species in different parts of North America. So they are only indigenous to the Midwest, but they've become uh, kind of invasive in places like Florida, where they're actually hybridizing with the native sliders there. Uh, they've become an invasive species in California, where they're out competing with Western pond turtles. Uh, they're even an invasive species in parts of Asia, where uh, pet turtles are becoming more and more common. So this picture here was actually taken by my brother-in-law in Hong Kong, and every one of those turtles, which are wild turtles, are red-eared sliders. They're not native Asian turtles. And they all either were or descended from a pet that was released into the wild at some point. Uh, they're even in Australia. Uh, they're in Europe. You see, there's two here next to a western pond turtle, probably in California. And it's thought that they're kind of outcompeting those and other indigenous turtles in the areas where they're introduced just because they're very prolific uh, and they're pretty aggressive. Will kind of kick other turtles out of their basking spots. And of course, they compete for food. So, yeah, you didn't know there were invasive turtles, there are invasive turtles. And Sam, um, do we at MDC uh, currently do any turtle monitoring or research? Uh, I know there was a project a couple years ago, I think around 2016, uh, in response to turtle harvest regulations. So under the uh, uh, Wildlife Code of Missouri, uh, you can harvest soft shell and snapping turtles. Uh, before this study, it was unlimited number, so you could harvest as many as you wanted in any given day. Uh, they changed that to two just because there were different studies coming out saying that that would Having an unlimited uh, bag limit uh, would be detrimental to the population, so they, they greatly reduced that to try and protect turtle, turtle populations in the state. Uh, but it was only those three species of turtles that are legally harvested. As far as uh, other research goes, uh, I don't know. I mean, they're not as uh, popular research subjects as some other animals, not as charismatic. That answers your question. Great, thank you. Okay, so the next one is also pretty similar uh, in appearance in nature. Uh, it's the Eastern River Cooter. It's a pretty big turtle, gets over a foot long. Uh, like the red-eared slider, it kind of has a dark shell with lots of intricate yellow markings. Uh, it tends to have a lot more yellow on its skin, though, on its neck. Uh, very, lots of broad yellow stripes. Uh, and the underside of it is kind of just a plain yellow. It doesn't have spots like a red-eared slider. Uh, this is a pretty good example. I think this one was turtle wax or something because he's just shining. You can see all those intricate yellow markings on him. Uh, they're not as widely distributed as red-eared sliders, though. Uh, they're mostly south of the Missouri River, as you can see in this little map. Uh, there's little hatchlings, uh, again, brightly colored. Uh, far more so than the adults. Very bright yellow. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the plain yellow plastering on those. So as their name would suggest, they're mostly found in rivers. Uh, they don't really occur in ponds or lakes or marshes or anything like that. Mostly a river turtle. Uh, and they are mostly herbivorous, uh, kind of like the red-eared sliders, probably even more so. Uh, but they will eat invertebrates and other animal matter, especially when they're young. So, yeah. This one's probably happy as a clam swimming around all of these tasty aquatic plants. And this is a picture you see all before. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty variable. Uh, sometimes markings on turtles can be very, very clear, sometimes very obscure. Uh, and that just depends on the age, if they're wet or dry, as well as just individual color variation. Uh, yeah, at a distance, turtles can be a pain to try and identify, especially because they always jump into the water last minute. Uh, so there's a cluster of river cooters. See lots of bold yellow neck markings. And there's actually a comparison between a river cooter on the left and a red-eared slider on the right, which has more or less lost its red ear. Uh, but you can still see the river cooter has a lot more intensive and thick yellow stripes all over its neck, as well as its arms, uh, and bright yellow plastron as well. All right, map turtles. 
This is actually three species in the same genus. Uh, there's the northern, the false, and the watchtop map turtle. Uh, they are mostly river turtles. You don't find them in ponds, kind of just like the river cooters. Uh, sometimes you find them in reservoirs or oxbow lakes, things like that. Uh, they're avid baskers, uh, just like the other turtles. Uh, they're very, very good climbers. You can often see them uh, have climbed several feet up a fallen log in the river just to find the best basking spot. Uh, and they are mostly carnivorous. Uh, they're eating mostly invertebrates and probably some carrion as well, so dead things. Uh, as far as their appearance goes, they all have some things in common. <clears throat> uh, so their head and their feet are all kind of dark, either brown or green, and covered with lots of yellow stripes, as many turtles are. Uh, their shell, as you can kind of see in this picture, uh, the very top of the shell, the midline, uh, is keeled, so it has these kind of raised spikes going along the spine, uh, and the very rear edge of the uh, carapace is kind of serrated. It's kind of sharp looking as well, uh, and that's fairly distinctive uh, map turtles. Uh, they are very sexually dimorphic uh, in that the males and females look differently. Uh, in turtles, it's usually the females that are much larger than the males. Uh, the reasoning for that is probably one, the females can carry more eggs if they're larger. Uh, and two, uh, if their males and females are different sizes, they're probably not competing for food resources quite as much uh, because the females are able to eat larger animals, or prey items than the males. So that's probably the reasoning for that. Uh, they're called map turtles because they have kind of these intricate markings all over their shell that look like either road maps or topo maps. Uh, they kind of fade with age usually, uh, and of course, if the turtle's dirty, you can't really see them, uh, but they can be pretty, pretty intricate and uh, kind of beautiful. Right, so we're just going to go over the three species of map turtles really quickly. Uh, so the first one is the northern map turtle, it used to be called the common map turtle. Uh, it has the most northerly distribution of them. Uh, the Ozarks is kind of the southwestern limit of its distribution. Uh, they have much weaker keels on their shells, so they're not as pointy or spiky. Uh, and these guys are actually pretty common in the Ozarks. Uh, they're one of the most common turtles in uh, smaller, high gradient Ozark streams, especially if they have a lot of uh, gravel or cobble. So they're really common in a lot of Ozark streams. Uh, if you're seeing a lot of little turtles basking everywhere on your float trip, uh, chances are they're probably this one. Uh, in Missouri, they're mostly restricted to the Ozark region, with a few exceptions here and there. Uh, but they do occur as far north, I think, as southern Canada, actually. And they are very cold tolerant, as you could imagine, from a turtle that lives that far north. Uh, what's cool about these guys, as opposed to some of the other map turtles, uh, is that the females look really, really different from the males. They have these enormous muscular heads and they use those for crushing snails, and mussels. I think they're even known to eat zebra mussels, uh, probably eating crayfish as well. They're just hard-bodied invertebrates. Uh, they're just cracking those with those huge mouths. Uh, so these ones are probably a little more specialized in their diet uh, compared to other turtles. You see here is just a comparison with the female on the left uh, and a male on the right. Just huge difference in head size and jaw strength there. Uh, there's another side-by-side -side comparison. Female on the left, smaller male on the right. I think the most distinctive thing about this species I forgot to mention is that uh, they only have a single spot behind their head. So you can kind of see in this picture. So it's just one little little dot, one little blob, uh, kind of behind their eye. Uh, that differentiates them from the other two species that we're going to talk about right now. And there's a little baby northern map turtle from the Courtois River. It's probably about a year old. Right, so the false map turtle, uh, it's mostly large rivers, sometimes oxbow lakes. Uh, it's often occurring in slower moving rivers with softer, muddier bottoms than the northern map turtle. Uh, the most distinctive thing about it is it has kind of an L-shaped marking, as you can kind of see in this picture, as opposed to just one circular marking. Uh, they also have some smaller spots around their jaw as well. Uh, in this picture, you can see it pretty well. Uh, it's just kind of an L shape right behind their eye, on each eye, bright yellow. Uh, their distribution in Missouri is a little patchy. Uh, it's mostly around the larger rivers, Missouri, Mississippi. Uh, I think that's a St. Francis somewhere around the Boot Heel. 
they're mostly living in <clears throat> larger, slower moving rivers uh, compared to northern map turtles. Uh, they also have much stronger keel, so those little spikes running down its back, uh, they're much more uh, prominent than northern map turtles. So much more spiky. And this is again just showing both L shaped markings and the sexual dimorphism. Uh, there's a young one. You see, he's got very high keel on his back and those nice L shaped bars behind his eye. Uh, there is a subspecies called the Mississippi map turtle. It uh, used to be considered its own species, but they changed it to subspecies a few years ago. Uh, the only difference is that instead of an L, it kind of has a sickle shape or a crescent moon shape behind its eye. Uh, and they occur pretty much only along the Mississippi River. And supposedly you can find some specimens that have traits of both. So it's probably a bit of a genetic mess. All right, last but not least, watch Tom map turtle. Uh, it looks pretty similar to the false map turtle, except it has uh, three large spots on its face instead of just one large L. Also has pretty prominent uh, keel and spines on its shell. Uh, it also lives in pretty large, large rivers. As you can kind of see from this map, it has a really weird scattered distribution in Missouri. Uh, it used to be considered a subspecies of map turtle. So I think uh, as far as record keeping and identification goes, it's probably not as solid. Uh, yeah, pretty patchy distribution, mostly larger rivers. Uh, this picture is probably a large adult female. You can see the three prominent spots on the face, on each side of the face. There's a little baby, Some three large spots, strong keel, probably another large adult female. And again, just you can see the three large yellow spots. All right, so this is the same picture I showed you before. Uh, I thought it'd be fun if you could try to look at it closely and see how many different turtle species you can see. I'll just give you a few seconds and you can type that in the chat box and see what answers we get. I'm pretty sure I know the answer. But... Any guesses? Number of turtle species. Jenna says they're all the same. <clears throat> no, they're not all the same. I think I see three. Three? I get another guess of three. Mm -hmm. Abram says two. Yeah. I think it might actually be four. I'm not certain, but if you look at the fifth turtle from the left, I think that might actually be a false map turtle. So you can kind of see he has a dark yellow marking kind of right kind of above and behind his eye. He doesn't look quite like the other map turtles. So uh, there are, I think, four northern map turtles, two on the left and two on the right. And there is a red-eared slider, third from the left. I think it's the only one there. And all the others are river cooters. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that one's a false map turtle. I could be wrong. But yeah, just point that out again, turtles are really hard to identify from a distance. Uh, of course, once you, get, once you get up close to them, they're just instantly in the water, so it makes it close to impossible unless uh, you have pretty good experience and really good binoculars. All right, the next family is Kynosternidae, it's the musk and mud turtles. Uh, there's three species in Missouri, but we're only going to talk about one of them because the other two have pretty limited distributions and they're mostly found in still waters instead of streams. Uh, so the eastern musk turtle is one we're going to talk about. Uh, it's the smallest turtle on our list. Uh, it's about four inches long. It fits in the palm of your hand, even when it's full grown. As far as its appearance goes, the only really distinctive thing about it is the two yellow stripes uh, going along the side of its neck. Its shell is pretty plain, just kind of brown, dingy looking. Yeah, you can see the, see the stripes on this one a little better. 
Uh, it's distributions mostly south of the Missouri River. That occurs in the Ozarks, as well as the Bootheel and kind of along the Mississippi floodplain as well. Uh, the plastering on these guys, the underside of the shells, kind of distinctive. Uh, so it's very reduced in size compared to other turtles. So it doesn't offer as much uh, protection from predators. Uh, the reasoning for that is probably it grants some greater mobility of their limbs uh, since they're mostly walking around on the bottom of the water as opposed to swimming, but that could just be a guess. Uh, there's a little hatchling. Uh, obviously, tiny turtles have tiny babies. Uh, that's a hatchling next to a quarter. Uh, yeah, you can picture the size of these guys. And they only lay, I think, less than six eggs, like two to five eggs in a nest. Uh, so how those, how few numbers, how few of those offspring that they make, how any of them actually make it to adulthood is, is kind of interesting to me. So you think something that small would get eaten by predators pretty quickly. Uh, so I kind of said before, they're poor swimmers. They're mostly walking around on the bottom uh, like these guys. That's where they're doing most of their foraging. Uh, because they're not very good swimmers, you're not going to find them in really swift moving uh, waters. It's not to say you can't find them in fast flowing rivers, but they usually occur in uh, slower moving sectors, generally like pool habitats, uh, overhanging banks, things like that, where there's a softer bottom and not as much of a current. Uh, they do bask. Um, Probably not as prolifically as some turtles, and they're a little harder to see just because they're so small. Uh, they're pretty good climbers, too. You can get pretty high up on different uh, different submerged logs. Yeah, you generally don't see them as often as the other turtles. Uh, they are mostly carnivorous, <clears throat> eating invertebrates, dead fish, maybe tadpoles. Uh, I know they'll eat hot dogs. <laughs> Uh, they do some foraging at night as well. And when they're disturbed, they actually release a stinky musk, kind of like a skunk or a snake. And it's actually how they got the name stink pot turtle, which is what they used to be called before it was changed to eastern musk turtle. So if you pick them up, your hand's going to stink, like this person's probably did. And again, in this picture, you can see the very distinctive pair of yellow stripes on each side of the face. All right, so the snapping turtles, family collider day. Uh, there's two species in Missouri. The first is the snapping turtle. It used to be called the common snapping turtle, but that was changed. Uh, they're the second largest turtle in Missouri. So they can get well over a foot long. Uh, and they can weigh over 35 pounds. I think the record was probably 60 or 70, something like that. Uh, pretty distinctive in turtles. They have a really long, thick tail. Uh, only snapping turtles have tails this long. Uh, and of course, they have a very strong hooked beak. So you can kind of see in this picture, the back of their shell is serrated, uh, kind of like a map turtle. This picture, you can also just see the tail, just how thick and spiny it is. Just it's very distinctive. Uh, and their bellies, kind of like stink pots, uh, they're pretty unprotected. They have a very small plastron. Uh, so that might just because it gives them better mobility, because they will walk around quite a bit, both on the bottom of the water as well as over land between water bodies. Uh, they also don't have to worry as much about predation just because they're so big. So it doesn't really matter that they're not quite as well armored. You see the strongly hooked beak. Uh, this is a snapping turtle hatchling. Uh, they're much darker than the adults. Sometimes they're almost black. Uh, they could kind of maybe be confused with any other young turtle, except for the fact that they have a very, very long tail, uh, just as long as the rest of their body. And only the two species of snapping turtles we have have tails that long. So as far as habitat goes, you can find them pretty much anywhere. Uh, they usually prefer kind of muddy areas, places with a softer bottom, softer substrate. Uh, that said, I have seen them in several Ozark streams that were uh, gravelly or full of cobble, uh, even bedrock. 
I saw a medium sized individual that tried to hide by cramming itself into between, you know, two pieces of a uh, bedrock in the stream bed to get away. Uh, so yeah, you can find them pretty much anywhere, streams, ponds, uh, lakes, large rivers, wetlands, uh, they're not picky. Uh, they will travel over land uh, quite a ways just to reach different water bodies or to lay their eggs. As far as their diet goes, uh, they are actually omnivorous. They will eat aquatic plants, uh, but they do eat a lot of animal matter. Uh, so they will eat invertebrates like other turtles, but they do eat a lot of vertebrates as well. So things like small snakes, frogs, uh, sometimes smaller turtles, uh, fish, uh, young muskrats, and even uh, hatchling waterfowl like baby ducks. They'll sometimes eat those. Uh, they are actually a game species in Missouri. I just touched on that before. I think you can take two in the aggregate soft, snapping and soft shell turtles uh, per day. Uh, as far as their reputation goes, they have a pretty bad one. Uh, it's not entirely deserved. Uh, a snapping turtle is never going to bite you while you're swimming around in the water. Uh, they'll only try to run away when they're in the water. But when they're on land, uh, yeah, they can obviously be pretty ornery. They will snap at you and try and look scary and get away. But, uh, no one's ever gotten attacked by a snapping turtle while swimming. Uh, they will bask. Uh, obviously, they're not as uh, agile as some of the smaller turtle species, as you can kind of see in this picture. Uh, I don't think he could uh, get much higher on that tree than he is now. Uh, but yeah, you can see them sometimes. I've seen them basking on banks of the current river. Uh, so they will do it occasionally, but uh, they tend to spend most of their time kind of in the water uh, compared to some of the other basking turtles. So they're very, very aquatic and they're, they're mostly just kind of walking along the bottom. <laughs> As you can kind of see that in this picture, he's grown so much algae on his shell uh, just because he spent so much time in the water. So another reason why turtles will bask so much is uh, it kind of dries them out, which prevents things like fungal or bacterial infections in their skin. Uh, but these guys are pretty good at staying underwater for very long periods of time. Uh, this guy also has a couple of leeches attached to his face. All right, so the alligator snapping turtle, I wasn't gonna talk about it originally, but I figured I would uh, just because people often mistake the two. They think whatever snapping turtle they see is an alligator snapping turtle. There is actually a difference. Alligator snapping turtles are very different animals. Uh, in Missouri, they have much more limited distribution. Uh, they're much rarer as well. Uh, really only find them in the southeast of Missouri, at least nowadays. Uh, they're mostly living in just like swamps, uh, slow moving rivers and oxbow lakes, things like that. Uh, you rarely find them in any sort of fast flowing stream or, or even a pond. Uh, and they're very, very aquatic, uh, far more so than the snapping turtle. Uh, the only time they ever come out of the water is to lay eggs. So other than that, they're spending the rest of the time walking around on the bottom. Uh, and they are thought to be at least exclusively carnivorous. And they look pretty different from the snapping turtle as well. Their beak is much more strongly hooked and they have just a huge, massive head uh, and their shell is covered in these large spikes, uh, three rows of them. Very different animal and much, much bigger. Uh, they can grow well over 150 pounds. I think the record was something like 300 plus pounds. Uh, so much, much bigger than a common snapping turtle. They could probably eat a common snapping turtle if they wanted to. All right, tree and Nikidae. So soft shell turtles. Uh, we have two species in Missouri. They're a pretty cool group of turtles. They're really, really ancient. Uh, they date back at least, I think, to the Cretaceous period. Uh, so the same rock formations where you find tyrannosaurs and triceratops. Uh, you can also find fossils of soft shell turtles. So uh, they're very, very old, very old group. Uh, they're pretty cool. And as far as turtles goes, uh, their shells are kind of unique. Uh, they're not as heavily armored. So the bones that make up the shell are much thinner. And they're also not entirely fused together. So there's kind of gaps in between that I think are mostly filled with cartilage. And a lot of the shell is just covered in skin. 
The entire shell is covered in skin instead of scales, uh, so that's why it's much it's much more pliable, uh, just because it's you know, it's not as heavily armored. Uh, so pretty distinctive snorkel noses. Uh, no other turtle in Missouri or even North America has a nose like that. And they do use them as snorkels, especially when they're buried under the bottom. They'll stick their head up, use their nose, stick it out of the water and breathe. Uh, they are sexually dimorphic as well. Females are a lot bigger than the males, about twice the size. As far as their appearance, sometimes they can have little spots, blotches or circles on their shell like this guy. Uh, sometimes they're much more blandly colored. Uh, this is probably a female. As far as their habitat goes, they're mostly found in larger rivers with soft bones, mud, sand. Uh, they're very aquatic. They're one of the most aquatic turtles in Missouri. Uh, they have very strongly webbed feet. Uh, they're actually pretty good at getting oxygen directly from the water through their throat. So they, they meet uh, more of their oxygen demands that way than many other turtles. Uh, they are mostly carnivorous. Uh, they will pick their prey either by ambushing them uh, while they're buried in the sediment and kind of snapping their neck out at any passing animal. Uh, they will also kind of actively forage like this one, searching about the water, looking for prey animals. And they'll also bury themselves as a form of uh, defense or hiding from potential predators, especially when they're small, more easy prey. Uh, that's where their flat shell really comes in handy. Uh, you will see them basking, especially along sandbars, uh, often found in those areas. Uh, they usually prefer to nest in sandy areas. And they are game species as well, just like the snapping turtle. So legally, they can take them by, I think, archery or grabbing them by hand or various line methods. Uh, it's not legal to shoot them. And anyone with a fishing license, I think, can collect, uh, collect turtles in that way. So there are actually two species of softshell turtles in Missouri. Uh, there's the smooth softshell on the left and the spiny softshell on the, uh, on the right. Uh, smooth softshell has much more limited distribution, and it's not as common. It's mostly found around larger river systems, uh, kind of like some of our other turtles, Osage, Missouri, Mississippi, habitats like that. Uh, the spiny softshell turtle, you can find it statewide. Uh, it's also not as picky about habitat. <clears throat> you can find them in higher gradient streams with cobble bottoms as well. So they're not as specialized, they're not as picky about their habitat as the smooth softshell. As far as telling them apart, that's pretty hard unless you have them in your hand. Uh, so both of them have stripes kind of on their neck. Uh, Smooth soft shell, they're usually a little more prominent. Uh, and spiny soft shells, that marking tends to fade. Spiny soft shells, uh, as you can see, sometimes they have little circular markings. Uh, smooth soft shells never have those. One of the more distinctive features is probably actually the spines. Uh, so you can see the turtle on the right, at the top of its shell behind its neck, it's got those very small spines on its shell. That's where they get the name, spiny soft shell. Uh, you can see in this, in this picture, which is probably a large female, uh, they're not always colorful or patterned. They can just be kind of a bland, sandy, muddy color. And this picture on the right really shows those spines on the shell uh, much more clearly. You can see the arrow. And the smooth soft shells, they don't, they don't have that at all. That's why they're called smooth soft shells. Uh, smooth soft shells also don't have any markings on their legs at all. So they're totally kind of unspotted uh, on their limbs, whereas the spiny soft shells are much more spotted, as you can kind of see in that picture. It's got all those little spots on his hands and the spines as well, as you can also see. Uh, there's just some baby soft shells. They're 
adorable. Uh, almost a perfectly circular shell. They look like little sand dollars with heads. Uh, this is kind of a picture just showing you the uh, how big they are compared to other turtles. So and that turtle on the right is probably a big female false map turtle, but uh, even she is dwarfed by the soft shell. So they're pretty big animals. Um, I think the females can get like 15 pounds or more over a foot long. There's just another comparison. Very big animals. There are some, there are some Asian species of soft shell turtle that actually weigh hundreds of pounds. And they're some of the biggest turtles in the world. There's just another comparison, some painted turtles. All right, almost done. Uh, so as far as threats to Missouri turtles, uh, there are some, uh, they're not as worse off, they're not as bad off as uh, other turtles around the world. So about half of all the turtle species globally are threatened with extinction. Uh, the reasons for that vary. Uh, part of it has to do with the fact that uh, turtles as a whole, they're just, they're not really designed to sustain any high levels of adult mortality. So their shelves gives them extra, extra protection, so they don't really have to worry much about predators. So they just kind of have a bunch of little offspring that have very low survival, because they're very easy to eat. Uh, but that's okay, because the adults are very, very long-lived, and they don't have many predators. They afford to just only have a few offspring uh, live to adulthood. But when you have people collecting them and eating them, or destroying their habitat, then they come into problems. So their population growth uh, is not very fast, so they're susceptible. Uh, in Missouri, one of the threats would be water pollution, uh, although America's waters have gotten a lot cleaner overall since the Clean Waters Act. Obviously, plastic litter, as anyone who knows, knows anything about sea turtles uh, can attest to. I can see the one in this picture, it had plastic wrapped around it while it was growing, so it kind of grew deformed. Its shell is obviously isn't the shape it should be. It's pinched in the middle. Uh, another big problem for turtles in America and other places of the world, uh, it's just habitat destruction. Uh, in Missouri, uh, that's often the form of things like uh, draining autumnland areas and swamps. So the turtles of our boot heel uh, have been less well off than turtles in other regions just because that area has changed so dramatically. It used to be all flooded bottomland swamp forests, uh, but it was drained through a series of canals and ditches like you see in this picture and uh, converted to farmland. Uh, so there's very little of that original habitat left in the Missouri boot heel. And a lot of the Missouri species uh, that lived in that area are not doing so well in this state anymore. Uh, turtle poaching is actually a pretty big problem across the world and even here in the United States and even in Missouri. Uh, I know Missouri Department of Conservation agents have had multiple cases of people either collecting turtles from the wild and then uh, exporting them uh, to other countries, both or as food, as well as just exotic pets. Uh, sometimes it's breeders that are collecting turtles or buying turtles from collectors and then passing them off as captive bred animals uh, so that they can then sell them either domestically or internationally. Uh, sometimes they're, they're licensed breeders. They, you know, they, they have a license to have some species, but uh, they might illegally keep others or more than they're supposed to. Uh, Poaching is a pretty big cause of turtle declines uh, across the world. And obviously road collisions. Uh, I'm sure everyone's seen dead turtles on the road. Obviously more, some species are more susceptible than this than others. So things like ox turtles, which are terrestrial. Turtles like uh, snapping turtles here, as well as painted turtles, which will travel over land a ways or much more at risk of being run over. Uh, in some areas where their nesting sites are kind of limited, uh, this can be a real impediment because it keeps them from reaching the areas where they have to lay their eggs. 
it's not so much a problem here as it is in some other parts of the country, but uh, yeah, still a lot of turtles get run over on the road, unfortunately. As far as uh, the turtles in Missouri that are of any conservation concern, one is the alligator snapping turtle, which we kind of talked about. Uh, obviously, being in the southeast, it was um, kind of vulnerable uh, because that area has been so uh, dramatically altered. So many of those areas were drained. So it's lost a lot of habitat. Uh, there's also some historic uh, consumption. People were eating them. Uh, that was pretty common in the 1800s and the early 20th century. Turtles were being uh, collected in large numbers for commercial uh, hunting or just subsistence hunting. People were collecting turtles and eating them themselves. Uh, snapping turtles, mostly common snapping turtles, were uh, one of the most common species used in uh, turtle soup. So you used to be able to buy cans of turtle soup and uh, usually that was snapping turtles. <laughs> yeah, uh, the alligator snapping turtle is, is pretty rare in the state nowadays. It's considered a species of conservation concern. Uh, the chicken turtle uh, it occurs in the same area, so southeast Missouri, boot heel. Uh, so it's actually considered endangered. Uh, it suffered that same habitat loss as other species in that region. Just not a lot of swamps left. Uh, the Blanding's turtle, that's a pretty cool one. It's kind of a marsh turtle, lives in wet prairies, uh, wetland areas. Uh, obviously not a lot of those left, they're mostly row crop agriculture now. Uh, there's really only a few very scattered populations left in Missouri, which is kind of at the southern end of their distribution anyway. But yeah, they are considered endangered in the state. And then there's the yellow mud turtle, uh, which is a cute little turtle, it usually lives in marshes. Uh, often in kind of the prairie regions. Uh, there's also a population, I think, in northeast Missouri along the Mississippi uh, River. Uh, so mostly living in wetland areas, marshes, uh, and they'll actually burrow into the mud during the summer uh, when the wetlands dry up, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, but again, but they're endangered in Missouri mostly because of things like habitat destruction, just uh, not enough suitable wetland habitat for them anymore. All right, it's exactly eight o'clock and I'm done. Excellent, thank you so much, Sam. Um, we did have a message in the chat uh, from Sarah Davis. Um, she says that uh, we see different roadkill turtles at different times of the year on our rural road. Um, and we were wondering if anyone's studying road mortality patterns in Missouri and are there any safe turtle passage projects? As far as safe turtle passage projects, if I had to guess, I would say no. Uh, that would be probably more in areas further southeast. Uh, there's a lot of really flat land and it's hard to make uh, safe passages for wildlife, especially turtles. Uh, so there's probably not any of those in Missouri. As far as study projects, uh, I would have to ask, ask Jeff Brigler. I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, I do believe that Jeff will accept uh, citizen data on road kills. Um, I remember when we took a, um, a reptile class several years ago that um, if you are traveling a certain stretch of, of a road um, frequently and you can identify a live turtle versus a dead turtle, um, he will take that data from you. I think you can just submit it directly to Jeff Brigler um, by email. I don't think there's any particular format or form um, involved with that. So, and I'll type in his email address. And of course, he'd be the great person to ask um, any of these questions um, about research and what you can do to help as well. And do we have any more uh, questions for Sam? I'll let you think on it for just a second. Again, thank a lot. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, that was really informative. Uh, love the photos. Uh, that really um, makes an impact, I think, when we get to see them up close. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, with that, I think I'll go ahead and stop recording. Um, again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, make sure to please join us um, on Thursday, November 5th, for Sam's next pres presentation on wildflowers near Missouri streams. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night.